Welcome to Aurora Connects Season 3. This is Episode 4 for Thursday, March 18th, 2021. Casting, Pitfalls, Best Practices, and Racial Justice. I'm Dawn Monique Williams, Associate Artistic Director for Aurora Theater. And as always, I'm joined by Artistic Director Josh Costello. Hey, Josh. Hey, Dawn. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I miss doing these things on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> then it yep. felt like a celebration headed into the weekend. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, it'll be on YouTube tomorrow on Friday. Yep. I'll watch it back. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking forward to this conversation a lot. I think there's just so much to dig into with this topic. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have great friends on the show with us, too. Um, as always, friends, we love it when you comment along, drop us questions on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, we're standing by to receive those. And also you can email us anytime at connects at auroratheater.org. That's connects at auroratheater.org. We love hearing from you. Um, right now, the show is still available as an audio podcast, but that feature might be going away. So use it or lose it, friends. Right now, you can still get us wherever you source your audio podcasts. Um, and if you don't want it in an audio format, then we won't make it in an audio format. It's as easy as that. We have coming up uh, in April the audio drama adaptation of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye uh, from Lydia R. Diamond's stage adaptation directed by Don Monique Williams. Um, this is just a beautiful production and I'm so excited to share it with you as our main uh, event uh, in the spring. It is um, included with your Aurora Theatre Company membership. So if you are a member, please make sure you check that out. And if you are not a member, you can buy a ticket to listen to this audio drama, and I strongly encourage you to do so. Information is at auroratheater.org about becoming a member, about purchasing a single ticket, whatever you want to do. While you are there at auroratheater.org, you can also click the donate button at the top right, and that will allow you to support us making, uh, telling stories like The Bluest Eye and, uh, and getting ready to come back and make plays for you next season as well. So thank you so much to everybody who has supported us by making a donation, by becoming a member. We're so glad that you are part of our community. A couple of our community partners have things going on this weekend that we just wanna amplify. So uh, the Berkeley High students will be producing their sort of annual hour monologues. It's a completely student run and organized production. And they are gonna be live streaming that on Saturday. The information is there for you on the screen. Looks like 7.30 p.m. on Saturday, live stream. And also, um, uh, Holy Fools, which is a theater company in residence at Laney College under the guidance of Michael Torres, will be working with us in partnership this Saturday to do a reading of Deirdre the Queer Queen by I, Ida. Um, and that is 5 p.m. on Saturday, so you can tune in. If you're an Aurora member, you already have that as a part of your membership. And if you'd like to watch, we do have single tickets for sale, and you can tune in. That's at 5 o'clock. We'll do a post-reading discussion, and you'll still be done in time to click over and watch the Berkeley High students do our monologues. Hope you check those things out on Saturday. I'm so proud of that community partners program. Uh, we've been partners with Berkeley High for a long time and um, Laney College and Holy Fools are a new partner and uh, they're doing really important work. And I'm really excited that we're able to um, to give them a, a some kind of support. So please check it out. Great, here's our quote of the week. Where the hell do I come in? Every damn body pushing me off the face of the earth. I want to be an actress. Hell, I'm gonna be one, you hear me? And that is from Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress. You know, I like to keep my quotes sort of in the in the theme of the of this week's topic. Yeah, and I bet we have some people watching who remember Aurora's production of Trouble in Mind several years ago. I hope they remember it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, bring in our guest, Josh. Let's bring in our guest. So, Dina Martinez, um, you are an agent with Cast Images Talent Agency and a longtime much loved Bay Area actor. You've um, uh, got long associations with the San Francisco Mime Troupe, Culture Clash, El Teatro Campesino, also uh, Cal Shakes, Berkeley Rep, Word for Word, Campo Santo, San Jose Rep, San Jose Stage, B Street, Capital Stage, Magic <laughs> Theater. Yeah, I mean, just on and on and on. Um, and you're also a, a freelance director, instructor, and casting director. Uh, you've been a casting director for many companies um, and done yeah. a ton of work. So welcome, Dina. It's great to see you. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thanks. 
And we also have joining us today, Jeffrey Lowe. Um, Jeffrey, you are the Director of Community Partnerships and Casting Director at the Tony Award-winning Theater Works Silicon Valley. You are also a director and a playwright who has also worked with theaters all over the Bay Area. Uh, Jeffrey, welcome. Thanks for having me. Good I'm so everyone. glad you're both here. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's start with this. Let's. So, so I, I'm sure we have lots of um, actors watching who are curious about the casting process, but we also have uh, people uh, who are not privy to the process. And I'd love to start by. Um, having you talk us through, and I should also say that Dawn uh, handles the casting at Aurora these days, and, and prior to, um, to that, I used to do the casting for Aurora, so we all have um, extensive casting experience here, and I'd love to share with our viewers what the typical casting process looks like. How does it work from sort of start to finish? Like, how does a show uh, wind up with uh, an incredibly talented group of, of actors? Um, uh, Jeffrey, you want to you know sort of start us off with that and and talk about maybe how it works at Theater Works and and what a typical process looks like. Sure. Yeah, at Theater Works. Um, I would say the the sort of standard process is, well, um, because we're a member uh, of LORT, the League of Regional Theaters, and, and our partnership with um, LORT and Actors Equity. Once we announce our season, which you know pre pandemic um, tended to be in February, like it was like the Monday before Valentine's Day is how I remembered whenever we did it. Um, <clears throat> after, after we announced our shows, like, like that night I went home, I, I'd have it all drafted out and I'd submit the, the season announcement to Actors' Equity. And from there I would choose um, when we would have basically our general auditions for the season. And, and what those are, um, I, you know, the rules sort of change a little bit um, every, every few years, but essentially the, um, the general auditions is a set amount of time for actors to be able to sort of show us what they got dependent on, not dependent on, but based off of what they see in terms of their interest in, in our season. But what's funny about that and, and what I would say, you know, we, we're only, we are required to do it once a season, but we tend to do it at TheaterWorks twice a season. And, and I would also say that although it, the announcement is dependent on the season we announce, I think that all of us on this call who have done a lot of casting would say that, you know, the general audition is, is sort of file building in terms of getting to know performers. And it's not necessarily just for the immediate shows that we have. Um, but from the general auditions, we go ahead and we, we have all of our files, we have our notes that we take on all the actors and all the actors that we know beforehand. And then from there, um, you know, if it's a resident director or a guest director, I, I then have meetings with those directors to, to have a conversation on what their um, vision for the show is and how casting lands upon that. Um, and you know, you get to ask a lot of questions, you know, for me as a casting director, I, I really look at myself as an advocate, both for the Bay Area acting community, as well as an advocate for just um, different forms of representation in terms of who gets to tell stories. So, so we get to have a lot of really exciting and joyous conversations about like, oh, a lot of times you'll see this type of person or this, uh, a person of this identity uh, in this sort of role, but what about, what does this look like? Or what does this look like? And then what we do is then we get maybe, you know, dependent on the role, five, six, sometimes two or three, if it's a more um, specific role, uh, options for different uh, roles. And we bring in our directors from wherever they're from, be it from the Bay Area or elsewhere. And we get to sh share, you know, the Bay Area talent with them. And then um, more often than not, what I try to do is I try to, um, have our local auditions with our Bay Area talent pool before we go elsewhere. Cause you know, best case scenario, we get, we get to cast everything locally. That's how we would want to do things. And so after we have our local auditions and the um, directors get to either meet our Bay Area talent or if they're a resident of the Bay Area, they see who's available and they get to um, see who is interested in, in the show. Then we have a better idea of where we need to, what roles we need to look outside of the Bay Area. And from there, we employ different casting directors. You know, if we're in Los Angeles, Chicago, or in New York, depending on where we're looking at, uh, we get to uh, touch base and collaborate with another casting director that I work with. And we talk about the things that I know about the director's vision for the show and where the theater's coming from in terms of how we want to do that. And from there, they do the same process in their, in their location. 
and from there hopefully we we just um build an, an amazing amazing and talented cast that tells the stories that we want to tell thank you and and dina um uh talk a little bit about that that like how how that's similar or different for from um other companies that you might have worked for and and uh, and can you get into a little bit of like what the once you've sort of gotten that list of you know five or six actors that you uh, you know are that that the team is interested in for a particular role and you start bringing them in for auditions and callbacks what is that what is that how do how do those go how do, what does that actually look like um, so I have a very similar experience as, as what Jeffrey does. It depends on the theater. You know, if you're a theater work size theater company or a Cal Shakes, you have that opportunity that you can go outside of the Bay Area. But I think most casting directors, I, I'm like Jeffrey, I like to try to keep it local as best I can. A, it's more affordable, but it's also, we have really good talent in the Bay Area. And we really try to push, you know, our, our, local talent forward so that you know when uh, outside directors come in we're like you don't have to go outside we've got it here you know for example when i cast quixote at cal shakes and it's an all latino cast um the director is from out of town out of state and there was nervousness can we cast locally and i'm like let's try first let's do that let's just fill the room with all latinos in the bay area and i bet we can do it and we totally did it we only cast one um role outside of the area and it was it was amazing and that cast went on to go do the show on the east coast and in texas and um so i was very very proud of that show that so show. it was a great show and it was all you know local casting so you can do it i i truly believe the talent is here um so then what uh, Jeffrey was saying was most of our lists are about you usually have a your dream cast and then you kind of go down the list about five or eight deep um, and have those auditions and then from there um, we I'm, I'm the same I meet with the directors uh, meet with the designers meet with the producers and then we um, have to send out sides and the scenes and the scripts to the actors and schedule their auditions. Um, I like to try to give actors at least a week with the scripts and the sides. Um, it's just, I hate when it's, you have an audition in two days and it's five pages of script and I don't think that's fair. So I try, I try to not to do that to too many actors. Um, and then uh, they come and they have the audition and they've got you've got pretty much five minutes in a room to nail it. <laughs> so, and then that's a whole other, you know, that's the process of how you do a good audition. Right. 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 And at that point, you're not doing like a monologue that you've rehearsed. You're, you're, you have a few pages of the script and the character yeah, think, you're auditioning for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, monologues, usually those are for generals. So that was that first step that Jeffrey was talking about and every theater um, with our contracts with the union, we have to have generals to invite the community, uh, equity actors first, and then the rest of the community of actors in um, to have a chance to audition for the company. And like Jeffrey said, it's not for a specific role, but it's to see the new talent that's out there and give you a chance at that theater. And then um, there's usually some, some great gems and we will add those to specific shows. So that's to come in and, and do that second part of the audition and that's when you come in and you just do sides we don't need to see the monologue and especially with the actors in the bay area if i know the actor i'm not going to make them do a monologue it's just a waste of everybody's time and it's i have good faith in our actors and so if i'm going to call them to audition for a specific role i want them to know i have faith in them um, already. I don't need to see that they have the skill set. I know they have the skill set because they're in the room with me to audition. Well, and so that's the thing. What are, so what are we all looking for in that audition, right? We know these actors have the skill set. Often they're actors that we know and have worked with before. We've seen them on stage. So what is it that, that um, translates from there to uh, choosing who gets the role? Well, I think it's a lot of times it's sort of dependent on what the, what the director's looking for, and I think that what's a lot of fun, I think I think some of my best memories is when an actor whom 
you were excited to see what they were going to do with the role, but it might not necessarily have been obvious for you that they were going to really run away with the role. When, whenever that happens, that always is the most exciting for me. Where, where a lot of times, and this doesn't happen every single time, but I think that, you know, there are, there are amazing times where auditions with, with specific actors really inform where the production goes for the director. Like the director learns something new about a piece because of what an actor has done in an audition. And I think those are really special moments in auditions. Now, I, I wouldn't say that's what we're looking for every single time. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you'll be doing a musical and you'll do a musical where there's just one person where you're just like, I just really need someone to hit this note. <laughs> and, like, and like, that's like, that is the hardest part of their job. I want, I want someone who can hit that note eight times a week. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's a lot of that special sauce of someone who really connects with a role and and connects and vibes with a director because I think that's another thing where you know uh, putting on a show is a lot of long hours and a lot of um, long tiring days and you just want someone that you're going to vibe with and someone that you're going to have a really good time working with and, and is going to be a good part of the room. I think that's very key too. You know, you can have great actors that come in and they just take up a lot of the space and they're not really listening. Um, so there's like, and and within five minutes you have to think about, is that gonna keep happening? Is that gonna happen in the rehearsal space? Um, and you're also like, again, that kinesthetic response in the room of how people are responding to the actor. And it's also, um, can they take notes? You know, it's like if a director, gives you a note, do you do the same reading that you just did? Or do you just make some great bold choice, even if it's wrong, you know, taking risks like that is always great to see. Yeah, I was taught as a director in auditions to always give the note, like no matter how perfect their reading was, give them a note just to see how they handle it and 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 how you work together and what the response is. And how, you know, that that's, uh, that's a big part of it for sure. Yeah, I love what you said, Dina, just about a bold choice, because um, you know, bef before I was uh, Aurora's like casting director, I was just casting for myself as a director, which is how I work primarily. Um, and so I was always looking for the bold choice. Uh, uh, sometimes I would even use the word dangerous. Now, I certainly don't mean like <laughs> breaking furniture or causing anyone harm. But just, I think even Jeffrey hinted at, just the thing that's a little bit unpredictable, the thing that isn't the like cliched choice, like the new choice you haven't seen. I, I, you know, I specifically was working in a lot of classical spaces, doing a lot of Shakespeare. So always like, what is that kind of um, new or different interpretation? And I love a like strong but wrong. Like I know, I, and I know like film and TV is a totally different thing where it's kind of like, you know, it has to be like performance ready, but I never expect an audition to be performance ready. So it's like, what can they, do they have strong impulses? Can they make a bold choice? And then can they make an adjustment? And that's sort of the information that I'm collecting and then casting the, the whole room, like thinking beyond just this one character, but like, what is the chemistry of the room? Um, and I am somebody who always sort of roots for the underdog. I like to kind of uh, trouble this idea of type. Uh, I'm not an ace at it, but sometimes it's like, well, what do we mean by they're not this kind of type or that kind of type? Like, but maybe they are. Like, what happens if, um, like, a leading person can be anybody? Because we're all the leading person in our own lives, right? So why wouldn't we presume that in a story the leading person could be taller or shorter or fatter or use a mobility device or be a multitude of religions or ethnicities. Um, so I'm always kind of just teasing Well, exactly. You know, I think one of the things that actors don't realize is we're at the beginning of the process. The director is also part of the ensemble. The director gets to play. The, the, the designers get to play. And so they're still making those decisions and you can be part of that process. And those decisions, when you come in with those choices and now you're part of the team, the directors don't have all the answers in that first, in their audition. They're also trying to make up their mind of what this looks like and the direction, they know the direction they're gonna go. They have an idea, they've seen some set designs, but it's like, it's still, the, the train isn't, isn't at the station, you know, it's on its journey. And so I think actors are a big part of that. And sometimes Absolutely. because they don't have a say in the process, 
of who gets chosen or how they audition, there it it lowers their status in the, in your mind. It can, and you have to remember. And I think when you walk in with that status, like a Stacy Ross, for instance, and you know, or a Margot Hall, and you walk in with that status, like I am in this room to collaborate. We see that. That's juicy to me. So. I know um, some actors get frustrated with the the number of callbacks that happen sometimes, and I know I've I've you know been guilty of putting actors through you know the ringer in terms of like you know you come in and do your monologue at the generals, um, and then you get called for uh, a specific play, and you go to the first round of uh, auditions for that, and then you get a callback and you come back and read with different people, and then maybe there's yet another callback to get you paired off with somebody else and see how that all goes. Like what? Why is it that sometimes it takes? multiple rounds of callbacks um, to, to cast a particular actor. I'll say sometimes, I mean, sometimes, in the, and to be honest, this is probably not one of the times that would frustrate an actor. Sometimes it's just hard to schedule getting everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you're doing like a musical with, with dance in it, sometimes you just can't get the music director, the choreographer and the director all in at the same time. So you just have to sort out to having people come in. Like we, we try our best, of course, especially given traffic and everything, the last thing I want to do is make people keep coming back in. And then, and then also sometimes I think that there, there is, you know, when we're talking about exciting choices and really cool things that actors are doing, some, sometimes for, for me, at least as a director, it's like, if there's like three, three crucial things that I'm, I'm looking for in a performer for this piece, and they just hit the first two so hard and I'm like I just need to make sure because of my personal anxiety as a director I just need to see if I can work with you and get that third piece in there you know what I mean so sometimes it's really just that and a lot of times it's like we're really rooting for you and we really want to make it make it happen you know oh we're always rooting for the actors I mean yeah. that's the thing yeah I, uh, yeah I think that's key too that they knowing that mm -hmm. we want you to get this role we want you to succeed that's why you're here you know we we don't want you to fail and, and I think another thing for actors when you first walk in or that, you know, that energy in that room, um, you got to hit it right out the, you know, right out the gate. You can't warm up in the room. You've got to hit that first side because sometimes we don't have time and it may not be what you're doing. It may be everyone got hungry and they're sending notes to each other. We may not get to your last big scene. And then you're like, oh, but I'm, but I want to do that because I'm really good in that scene. I worked that one. You gotta, you've got to hit the first scene, just like like a pro, and and go from there. Because um, if you warm up in the room, it's it, that's not a good choice. I want to add, like, I love actors. I think I'm a director because I love actors, and I think of actors as my primary collaborator and have frustrated a lot of designers <laughs> because I'll say, well, how can I know that yet the cast isn't in the room? And so Dina, like when you say there's that, that sometimes that status that we find because actors don't have a say in who gets the part and so many decisions are made before casting happens or before rehearsals start, that it's like, what is the space that we can leave so that when the process starts, the actors can feel really empowered to be full collaborators um, as part of the process. So I, I, I want every actor to book the gig. And, um, and so sometimes it's like, it's not just the form letter when it's like, oh, we had more qualified people than we had roles for. Like it, it often is genuinely the truth. And, mm. and I'm always, I'm totally guilty of always then thinking ahead to like, okay, well, it didn't work out on this project. But, you know, two or three projects down the line, there might be another opportunity for this actor again. So my wheels are always turning for um, for actors, and it's especially our local community here, which I agree is really, really strong um, and, and filled with many of the people that are like my favorite actors in the world are right are right here. Yeah, I agree. We, so we, we were going to have one more guest on this episode um, who couldn't be here at this time, but Don, uh, you pre-recorded a little bit with Lavina and Jidwani. Will you introduce this clip and, and tell us why we wanted to talk to, to Lavina yeah. and who she is? Um, so Lavina Jadwani is a Chicago-based um, director primarily, but she's also a playwright adapter and, 
and she was doing a lot of casting sort of uh, started as her as an artistic director and kind of inherited the casting as that and then she's of South Asian descent so she got pulled in to consult on a lot of culturally specific things and she wrote a couple of articles for HowlRound on um, color conscious casting and then as the language evolved um, she got in a conversation about identity conscious casting and um, and so that has been viral and making the waves and we wanted to have her on the show she's a great pal of mine and she just couldn't meet at this time or place so I met with her separately and we did a robust interview that will play the full thing at the back end I think of folks who are viewing want to stick around but right now we'll watch a little clip um, that's about our conversation around identity conscious casting and sort of her use of the term and and how it made its way into her vocabulary and how she applies it. So Amanda, that is um, clip one. Part of it is as a casting director, you know, I like to use the term identity conscious work, which for me means, because I'm a text-based director as well, right? Like here's the givens of the text and here's the givens of the human being and like, let's line them up and and see what that, I had a, I had a professor in undergrad who said like any, any theater company with, oh good, I'm wearing my OSF swag for this. Uh, any theater with um, Shakespeare in the title, he was like, any theater company with Shakespeare in the title is effectively a cover band. Um, and I think he kind of meant it as a drag to be honest, but I was like, I am into this. And so like, especially, you know, when I'm working on Shakespeare, when people are auditioning for Shakespeare, I'm like, I want to see a good cover band. Like, I'm not interested in seeing those plays as they were done because I wouldn't have had a seat at that theater. But like, I am interested in a good cover band. Like, can you teach me something about this play that I didn't know was there? Awesome. I definitely want to be in a room with you. Um, so I was really interested and I continue to be interested in those conversations in general, right? Because I feel like, especially when it comes to like adaptation or the canon, whatever we want to call it, oftentimes the text is sort of like held up on a pedestal. And I don't know about you, but like for me, uh, you know, as I was, as I was getting trained and as I was like coming up and assisting, I was in a lot of places where it was like, well, here's the text and the text is on a pedestal and we have to like run and jump and do everything we can to like meet it because the text is good and the text is absolute. Uh, and especially when it comes to Shakespeare, where we don't have definitive versions of that text, I'm like, what? Uh, what is the thing that we're chasing? So this idea of being a cover band, if you want to call it that, this idea of identity conscious work and like seeing how these how these givens line up with the givens of the human is very interesting to me. And part of the reason, I'll be honest, that I got out of um, casting was I, I found that we would have a lot of those conversations in um, in the casting process. And sometimes those conversations would carry into the rehearsal room into that process, but sometimes they would not. And and the truth of the matter is I, I could tell even without being in the room for rehearsals. I And it was very surprising to um, a director I worked with when I said, they were like, you can tell, like you can tell if um, uh, a family racially does not biologically look like uh, they are related to each other. And we had that conversation in the casting room, but we didn't have that conversation in the rehearsal room. She's like, you can tell the difference. I was like, yeah, I mean, I think we can tell when people are, are, are living their full truths on stage and when they're not. And I, you know, I, 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 prefer, I prefer to see the full truth. I love that idea of, of wanting to see actors living their full truths on stage. Um, uh, Dina and Jeffrey, either you have a, 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 any thoughts you want to share about about this idea of identity conscious cat? I mean, we may, may, maybe talk us through the, the progression that seems to have happened in the field from colorblind casting to color conscious casting. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I always felt colorblind always meant then you weren't really looking at, I don't know, that's always been a weird thing, that that term, colorblind, I, I, and you know, that was the earlier days. So I get, I like that, that it's, it's just about like, what is it about that person that's in their, you know, bag of tricks or in their luggage or being, you know, like, is this a family person? Is this someone who, uh, like, it's more about the experience that that person brings along versus what they actually look like. You know, I did um, August Osage County and I, you know, played Amy Resnick's sister because I just, I grew up with sisters and I grew up in a family and I grew up in a family with a grandmother like that or a mother like that, you know? So it was more about that kind of, who I was as a person to fit in this family of white people um, where, based on what I look like when I actually have that experience, you know? And, and if it takes a director to look past that and just be like, oh, actually, she's actually really right for this role because she actually has, this is, this is who she actually is, you know? This is, she, and this sits in her, 
it sits in her body, you know? And I think that's what we're, we should be looking for is where does this place sit in this person's body and in their story of what they're bringing to the table. I mean, this is the thing what we always tell young actors out of grad school, go get some experience, you know, or go or find what is your experience and get it in your body, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, similarly to that point, I think, you know, the, the, the journey, the, it's been, it's great to be in a place where we are now looking at identity conscious casting. It's really wonderful to be able to look at, you know, and, and it's not even just with casting. I, I think I, I'm hoping that in terms of with all artists that we work with, designers, technicians, directors, playwrights, everyone that we're able to look at who we all are in a holistic level and, and, and let, let that really inform our art the way that we, we know that it can, can create even more fruitful work. And I think that, you know, to, to talk about that progression, like for those, like I'm sure everybody here already knows what the progression is, but just in case, you know, co color blind casting is, is what it sounds like. Everyone's like, oh, we're just gonna cast, either cast the, the quote unquote best actor for the role, like regardless of what their eth race or ethnicity is, or um, we're going to, you know, if we're doing sisters, it doesn't matter what, if they're the same ethnic race or ethnicity or anything like that. And we're just gonna direct the play exactly the same regardless of who's in the role. And then with color color conscious and then identity conscious, it's, it's, it's including who, who these people are as a part of the art making process and a part of the story. And I think that's just so wonderful because really what that does is it's that next level of mindfulness and engagement with, with thinking about the fact that representation matters. So it's not just like, oh, I get to see people like me or with my, with my background or my identities on stage or on camera or anything. It's actually considering what does that mean to, to have someone play a certain role? What does it mean to have the, the Asian American actor, even if it's not an Asian role necessarily, what does it mean to have like the Asian role be always the person that's bullied say? Or what is it to have one type of person always be the one who is working in labor roles or anything like that? So it's like actually taking into consideration what those things are. And I have this really cool story where it really um, cracked open for me really well in my, with my hat as just a, a freelance director. I, I was directing a production of Eurydice. And um, I had a wonderful Filipino actor named Wes Gabrio, local actor, um, as my Orpheus. And we were working together and we we're having a great time. And I, I, I really wish for, for the sake of our costume director, I had this idea beforehand, but it was of course like in tech, like we were about to go into previews when I had this idea, but we're sitting there and we're doing the wedding scene where Orpheus and Eurydice are, are you know, having their wedding and they're, they're having their, their um, reception. And then there was a part of me, we see him, he looks great in his suit and he's doing all of his things. And then there was a moment where I'm like, oh my God, what if, what if we put Wes in a barong Tagalog, which is the traditional thing, or the traditional um, top that a Filipino, male identifying Filipino person would wear at their wedding. And I'm like, and then we, we, we found one. It was a little too big for him because I, ha I gave us the idea with a day to go. And, and, but it was so moving and so emotional. And then what cracked open for me was like, oh, Orpheus so often has been played by white actors. So let's just talk, we're just talking about race here, right? Um, has so often been played by white actors. And by putting the barong on him, it, it changed it from, oh, Wes is playing a white person to my Orpheus is now a Filipino person. And yeah. that does so much to crack open the complexities and what we could explore within the plays that we're doing, which I think is so, so cool. And it allows, I mean, like Lavina said, it allows the actor to bring their full self to the role. Um, and that, and there's a there's a difference when when that happens. You get it. You get a better performance. You get a more uh, fully realized um, life on stage, uh, and that that makes it that makes it better and more surprising and more interesting. And and uh, and it's yeah it yeah. We have the the you know the title of this episode is is uh, pitfalls, best practices, and and uh, and racial justice, but um. So, so let, let me ask about pitfalls uh, first. What are what are some pitfalls with casting? Where 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 can the process go wrong? Um, and 
uh, and what what can we do to to avoid them? Uh, don't look like you're a headshot. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you need to look like your headshot and uh, don't lie on your resume. We know everyone. Mm -hmm. um, that's a start. Um, uh, know the director you're auditioning for. Know mm. the play. Read the play. Do your homework. That's the, just the basic, basic, but it's it, you'd be surprised. So... <laughs> You got to know the play. You got to read the play. You got to know the director. You got to know the theater you're auditioning for. Like, do do your homework. And what about in the other direction? What about what about uh, things that that the casting director or the director or the theater um, uh, might do that that impedes the process? I would I would say that you know, you you can land on just making only the obvious choice. You know, and I think I think it might not. Maybe maybe the the issues or the um, not problems, but you know the what that does might not creep its head in like one show. But if you are constantly just making obvious choices with your casting and only inviting the obvious choices in for your callbacks, then then I think that your shows are gonna your your art making is gonna feel stagnant. And also, there's gonna be a point where you know maybe the people that you always want to work with are unavailable. I mean, we have amazing talent in the Bay Area. And also we have a lot of theaters in the Bay Area. <laughs> so, so, you know, that, that's the other thing. We're not, not everyone is available to you at all times. So I think that a big pitfall is not putting in the effort to get to, I mean, I think everyone on this call, we see a lot of theater. We watch, we watch everyone's shows as much as possible. We get to know people. And so I think that, um, that that's crucial to the role of, of a casting person is to see not only the, the shows that you're doing, but see the shows that people are doing all around and, and, and invite, invite people that excite you. And even if there's just like a little, a little uh, twinkle of, of like, I wonder what that is. They made me lean in a little bit. Just invite them. What, what's, what's it going to hurt? Yeah, I really do think that directors and producers should go see other theater, other, you know, other work out there. I think it's how you grow, how you get inspired, you know? So. Mm-hmm. Well, and Dina, you said this earlier, I think we were already on the air, but um, when theaters give actors a booklet of sides and no time to adequately prepare, um, I have long felt that that is so not necessary. So I hope to not um, be guilty of that <laughs> at Aurora, but, um, but certainly I think that that for me, that sort of old adage is like, oh, they know what they want within 30 seconds. Like if we're saying that, then we also don't need to give an actor 10 pages of sides. <laughs> so we don't, like both things aren't true, right? We either know or we need them to do half the play for us in order for us to make up a decision. Mm -hmm. So I would love for theaters to not put that burden on actors. Um, also, there's, a, there's sort of a movement um, to be paying actors you know, once you've called them back a certain number of times or, you know, once you're asking them in um, for more than a regular callback, that you should then be actually compensating them for their time. And, and um, either way, I think that's great. If that means that theaters are then going to compensate those actors for their time, great. If it means theaters are going to like clean up their act and be better prepared and streamlined in their processes, great. Um, I would love to run another clip of Lavina as we talked about um, this idea of the best person for the role and how we use that um, language and how that language has been gatekeeping language um, for so long and then was part of this idea of colorblind and so where we're at with that. So Amanda, that is clip three um, where Lavina and I talk about this notion of what it means to cast the best person. It's interesting, right? I mean, part of it is, and I still use that word best sometimes, but I'm realizing, you know, it's, it, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to veer away from it a little bit just because, especially in the classical community, right? I, I've been asked, God's bread, it makes me mad. The number of times artistic directors have asked me, well, is it more important that the work is diverse or the work is good? And I'm like, why are we ask, acting like that for me? That Venn diagram is a circle, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, for me, actually, I, I, I mean, I think casting is storytelling, right? I, I, I think casting directors should be treated like designers because I think they 
are them, you know? And, and again, like that was part of it for me was like when I was on staff at places and I was part time, I was sort of like caught, caught in between a rock and a hard place, right? Of like, I'm not actually like on the production team, but I'm not, you know, full-time staff, but I'm not part of the ensemble. You know what I mean? So it's a little like, ah, who am I representing? And, and, but I think, um, you know, for me, I think casting is storytelling. And, and so for me, it's, it's actually just about like, what is, what is the story that I'm most interested in telling right now? Like, what's the story that's unlocking the text for me? And, um, yeah. And then, and then, uh, and right. And that's part of the reason I think we have to like have the conversation and keep having the conversation is because for me, especially in terms of casting, right. We know that it's like not all of the pieces fall in place at once. Right. So sometimes it's like some of the pieces fall in place and then all of a sudden you go, Oh, I thought I was looking for this, but actually now that like these four or five things have sh shaken out this way, I actually need, you know, this to be this other thing. I know this is like hard without examples. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm, I think that's ultimately what we're chasing, right? Is what is the, uh, and it might be the best story. Again, that's subjective. I think for me, it's like, what's the, um, well, right, as directors, right? What's the story that's most in line with the big vision we're chasing? Because, you know, in the casting process, we've already started oftentimes with design. Well, I guess it depends on where we are. But, uh, but yeah, for me, it's about what's the story that lines up best with the whole of the big thing I'm chasing. I always um, think, for me, I find that word best to be less useful, but certainly in sort of adopting whatever like house protocols, wherever I'm directing, um, I think will sometimes um, casting a person who uses a mobility device is best. So let's uh, weed out uh, other people that don't fit that demographic or sometimes um, what's best is to bring me 20 people <laughs> to sort of screen for the role because I'm not looking for Elizabeth Taylor to play, you know, the Maggie the cat that I'm creating. So no, I need more options, not just this one type. So it's, so it's an interesting um, thing. I, I think best can be a pitfall, <laughs> this idea of, of best. Um, can really limit us, I think, in our in our thinking. I always, when I read a play, you know, you always open that first page, right? And it's got the cast list. And I don't, I don't, I look at it, I write the, the roles down, but I don't put any names down. And then when I, as I read the play, I just open myself up to hear what voices start. And all of a sudden I hear, you know, an actor's voice that I know or, and then another actor's voice, like different lines can all of a sudden jump out at you and you just hear a certain actor. And then all of a sudden, and then you're like, oh, then it's this actor, you could get stuck. But if you keep stay open, that role can turn into many different actors until you get to the end of the play. And I always like have a notepad while I'm reading a play and I just write the actors down really quick. So I don't forget of like, who jumped into my head? Whose voice did I hear all of a sudden? Who did I just see in that? in that vision of reading that play. That's one of my, the funnest part is like cracking that for that play open for the first time and seeing what voices come to me. And, you know, by the end of the play, I could just look at the page and it's like, all, where'd all these Filipino names come from, you know, or where did, you know, it's just amazing. Cause if you just, without the like, oh, I need, it needs to be a, a black voice or a Mexican voice or whatever. I just kind of just want to hear the voices first from what's happening, so. I, I, I do the same thing. I mean, I definitely hear actors' voices when I'm reading plays, especially yeah. when it's a play I'm, I'm gonna be directing. Um, but I'm also very wary of um, this sort of, I feel like there's a sort of paradox where there, I definitely have actors that I've worked with before that I love working with and that I have a great relationship with and that I have a shorthand with. And, uh, and those are the, voices that I most easily hear when I'm reading a play. Those are the ones that, that come to me without me having to think about it, right? And I, and I wanna be sure that, um, that I'm uh, leaving myself open to other possibilities. But at the same time, I think having an artistic relationship that goes beyond one play can be really valuable. And you can, you can you know, uh, discover things and, and learn and grow together as artists. Um, and so it's I feel like dance. that's always an interesting balance to try to strike. Yeah, it's a dance for sure. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, Josh has heard me say this many times. I love the idea of company, and I mm. sort of miss that model of acting companies. Um, so what it means, right, is that you have to have a lot of um, friends. Like you, like you have to know <laughs> a great variety of people um, to, to lean into that acting company thing. You can't populate that with just the same type or a limited type. Um, so you just have to have that Rolodex that's very, very full and then think of, you know, what what are the, the healthy alignments and the right opportunities and then what are the right opportunities for certain company members down the line. And of course, I spent six and uh, seventh hypothetical season at OSF where where, you know, company is so much in the fabric of it. Um, and I really do love that idea, but there was certainly this like rotation of like, okay, some people take a little break while new people come in and then people want to explore other options. And so, um, so I think of our Bay Area community in many ways as it's like, as its own company. Like we have, we do mm -hmm. have a company, an acting company mm -hmm. here in the Bay Area that, um, yeah. that we're able to you know, invite in and while we may not have a contract for all the actors that we want to have contracts for every season, I am thinking always down the line about like, okay, well, I would love to work with that person again. So I'm thinking of that person and okay, when this project comes up and you know, like it's a huge point of pride for me. It's so, it's so silly, but, um, but last year at Aurora, I did a bull in a China shop. And then over this year of the pandemic, um, I've had opportunities to work with each one of those actors again on different projects. Well, I've certainly had opportunities to offer them all uh, a paid gig. I, maybe I wasn't the director on all the paid gigs. Um, but that has been like such a point of pride for me that it's like, I'm gonna keep looking for these opportunities for these actors um, that I adore so, so completely uh, without limiting myself to like only this five actors, but knowing that there's this concentrated group of people that I'm deeply devoted to as collaborators. I think that's important. And I think companies work, I think, you know, it, and it's, it's really nice for those actors that are in those companies to, to just kind of have a home base. I mean, it's really important to artists. So, um, so when you're asked back to a theater and you're in a couple of shows and a more show or one a season, you feel like that's your home theater, right? And so that's, that is really important to actors. I think the the pitfall, the danger is you don't want to um, lean too heavily on your companies so that your audience is only seeing the same people over and over mm. and over again, because that also gets boring for your audience as well. And, um, and you want to bring new blood in because it, it keeps everybody on their toes and it brings energy into the group. So I think you definitely have to have the director and uh, has to have who they work. That, that shorthand I think is very important. And I think that goes same for playwrights. Playwrights really like to work with actors who understand their language and how their words fit in their mouth. They want those actors that they can trust with their words. That's very important to them. So a lot of that comes into play too for casting is a lot of times, um, I, I was the casting director for Playwrights Foundation for a long time. And that was very important um, to hear from the playwright who they envisioned in their plays and who, who they heard when they were writing that play. So that's, that's key to casting as well. But I do think that I've seen theater companies be stuck in, in their companies um, and it's um, it just be, start, the theater starts to become catered towards those actors. So they're not making big, bold choices in, tour, in terms of the plays that they're choosing or the work that they're doing and it's not quite as daring and they're just stuck in this box um, with their company. So I think, I think it's a dance. I think you want to have that company and those people that create the Aurora Theater Company that the audience gets a joy out of seeing over and over again that you want to work with over and over again, but you also want to bring in that new blood and, and fresh ideas. So, um, and if you have a season, you know, you have room to do that. So I, I think that's just, an, it's, it's a dance. 
Yeah. So similarly to uh, what Dina was saying, you know, it's so interesting to think too, like a lot of the reflection that I've been doing with, with the companies that I work with um, over this pandemic on how we can be more equitable and inclusive and, 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 and how have we, how have we, despite maybe best intentions fallen into not, not having opportunities for, for more people than we wanted to. It's, it's so interesting to look at. It's like, okay, well, why, why don't we have more like with, with all roles, designers, directors, like, why don't we have this? And like, okay, well, this resident person or this friend of ours usually gets two lighting gigs a season. And this person gets X amount of gigs a season. This person gets X amount of gigs a season. And then you look at it, it's like, oh, well, gosh, we, we have, we have one spot each season. And then, you know, so it's, so it's really interesting. It's really that balance. Cause, and, and I think we all, we all have that, right? Like I, you know, when we were talking about the people that we have the shorthand with, like a person I just jumped to was like, like right before the pandemic, I remember sitting with Jomar and I remember like we, we had the string with me and Jomar did be it gone up at Capitol stage. Then we did language archive at theater works and we did this education project right before the pandemic hit. And I remember at the end of the education project, I sat and we thought about, it was like three in a row. And I'm like, Whoa, that was a hell of a run, man. That was really fun. And it was just like really cool to have that. But at the same time, it's just like, as Josh was saying, and Don was saying, all of us were saying, it's like, it's, it's having that and respecting and honoring these friendships because really so much of what this is about is these, the creating these relationships and these artistic bonds, but also being mindful of it so we don't fall into, you know, title of the, the, the thing, uh, the pitfall of also of unintentionally not allowing more voices to come in because as we are trying to be, tell more diverse stories and, and more specific stories and more, and more identity conscious, um, you know, choices, we want to be able to meet as many people as we can. So this ties into the, the the third part of the title, and and I think a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about ties in with with racial justice. But I want to just sort of bring it to the surface and ask, um, how does casting relate to racial justice, and and what how might casting be a tool for um, for racial justice, um, and and what does that mean, and what are the what are the limits of it um, as a tool for racial justice, and what are the opportunities of, of casting as a as a uh, avenue for for racial justice. It's a big one. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, to chew on that for a second. Um, I mean, I think it's this, it's, it's, I, I mean, as a, as an artist of color, you know, it's something I've always done. So to me, it's, it's, I guess, yeah, when you read a script, it's being open to, you know, the, the opportunity that you have, you know, to have um, not the, what you would think is your obvious choice, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think the representation that we've been talking about all along yeah. is a big part of it. And it's been a, and, and, and really casting has been um, working in opposition to racial justice in a lot of ways. Um, uh, in the past and and continues to be in, in some cases um and so looking for ways to um to break that open uh, certainly you know, like it's that. interesting i i'm with this whole with the whole um you know the theater is getting called out in the last year um and the whole bipoc movement and um which was totally mind-blowing and exciting to watch crack open and watch how we all you know dealt with it and reflected on it um but i find i'm i'm what i'm finding is that a lot of theaters are 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 dealing with it in a way that is still not inclusive it still feels very exclusive. So it's like they'll give, say, you know, one night a week for black plays and black readings every night this week, every, you know, Wednesday at seven, it's going to be our people of color and it's all black plays and it's, that's what we're going to do. And that's our offering. But then you'll look at the every other night and they're doing readings with 
their company that's all white, you know? So I'm just like, thank you for that gift, you know? So it's kind of like this weird, um, so as a casting director, I would be like, if I was in a theater company and that was happening, I would also be like, how do we get those Tuesday night actors into the rest of the company or the rest of the season? Why, how are we, you know, it, it feels like it's a, it's a peace offering in a way. And it's, and, and it's not just one company, there's many companies doing it. And I, and it's like their baby step and it's like, and I, and it's COVID and everything shut down. So we don't know what they're going to produce on their stages. So it's hard to judge, but right now it's just this, like, we're going to give you a night and it's not going to be Friday or Saturday, but we're going to give you a night, you know? And so that's a little like, mm, not so much. And then the other thing too, is it's like, there's a lot of attention to our, you know, black African-American brother and sisters, which duly respect and duly should be getting. Um, but I am not seeing the Latino community out there at all. And I, hope that the casting directors and and because so, the seasons are going to change come the fall we're all going to see a lot of um plays and i'm wondering how many asian or latino plays or disability plays or whatever plays we're going to see because we're so we've been so called out on black oppression that that's our focus but bipoc is not just that. And so um, we have an opportunity to cast many, many ethnicities, many cultures, many backgrounds, many uh, she's, him's, hers, they's, you know? And so it's, it's, it's opening up our, our frame a little bit more in terms of like these band-aids I'm seeing uh, it, you know, it's like these quick fixes or that are happening and it's like, that's okay, but now what, you know, that still doesn't change. I, I'm waiting to see what their main stage is, what the main stage is going to look like. What's the opening show? What's the Christmas show? That's what I want to see, you know, and what is it going to look like? Um, that's, I don't know what <laughs> on a tangent, but that's a thing. That is a thing for casting directors to be really aware of. That's that's the shift that I saw. It was like, okay, now we're focused here. It's 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 bigger than that, you know. And it's like I don't want for our communities to have to be hurt in order, you know, to to have a voice. You know, that what's happening to the Asian community right now is so painful to watch but I don't want that to be the catalyst of why now we're gonna look we're gonna give them a show you know it's like it shouldn't come from that and um same with the Latino community you know it's like we got kids in cages but that shouldn't be the catalyst of why you should see our stories on stage or why we can't help tell our universal stories you know yeah it shouldn't be reactive I mean it should I mean certainly yeah. there are reactions that need to happen but there should be proactive work being done exactly. exactly it's like react absolutely and we should be reacting and we should be protesting and etc but it but it needs to really be a, a broader it's a broader story that needs to um be t told i have a whole soapbox stump <laughs> about casting as the site of of racial justice um and as a as a way of you know, uh, dismantling other oppressions. Um, but I'm not a guest on the show. I'm just a co-host. Um, but I, but I will say that, um, that, you know, casting is one arm programming is another arm. And, and then we have to challenge ourselves to be mindful about the gatekeeping language that we use. I love that Lavina said when she's asked by an artistic director, you know, do you want to favor diversity or do you want to favor quality? And she said, that's a circle. They are not separate. Right. So, yeah. First, we have to go into it believing that high quality talent exists in every race, religion, ability, you know, that we first have to just even go into it believing. 
And mm. then we have to start rooting out this dangerous language around, you know, craft or technique or they have to have this kind of training or the, because maybe they don't or maybe, you know, like, I, I mean, like, I, I think of like Davi Diggs as uh, somebody, he graduated high school with my brother. So, so I know Davi to be a, a trained actor. Um, but I think most of America knows David as a rapper. <laughs> and so they're thinking, oh, how can this rapper be? David has been training as an actor since he was a child, right? He did Yaw and Young Conservatory at ACT. So he's yeah. a highly trained actor. The question is really, when did David become a rapper? You know, that's like <laughs> questions like, David, you weren't rapping at 14. You were doing like Neil Simon plays. So what's going on? <laughs> um, so it's that thing that we take for granted that we know something about a person's background or skill set by just looking at them or by thinking, oh, well, they grew up in this place. So they, they didn't have access to these things. I'm like, we don't know. You know, and maybe somebody who, who grew up um, you know, in an urban community listening to hip hop is going to have the most facility with Shakespeare, right? Maybe somebody who grew up in a, in a South Asian household had cultural practices that are going to immediately translate or, or like Filipino kids, they do a lot of cultural performing arts stuff that they're trained in. We don't see it in our sort of Western canon, but they have it. And so when you're like, oh, we want to do this song and dance thing, they're like, yeah, we, we've been doing that since we were kids you just never asked so i i just think we have to get rid of some of that like elitist classist white supremacist thinking where you have to speak shakespeare a certain way to be considered a an actor it's just not it's just not true um and i also think that you know people of color want to do things that were written for them in their voice and play kings and queens and do Shakespeare. So some will want to favor one and some are going to want to focus on the other. And it's not like, it, it's not even the strict binary or the strict dichotomy, like pr give all the opportunities. I think of one of my late mentors, Tommy Gomez, who just left us recently, mm -hmm. um, talked about a lot, you know, why he was drawn to Shakespeare is that he, he wanted to play English king. Like that had value for him as a Chicano to, to be able to to be royalty and to see himself as that way and for his family to come and be able to see him embody those roles. And um, that's always stuck with me. So I think we just have to do the work and we're not doing the work. I hope that, you know, when we look at like Dina and Jeffrey and Don and Lavina are now part of the casting equation, right? And it's not just the Joshes of the world <laughs> that we'll see, you know, that it takes, I mean, it takes all of us, right? It's going to take all of us to do this to do this work, but for so long, um, it hasn't been all of us doing the doing the work. Well, and and the Joshes of this world have got to get on board with this, you know. <laughs> they do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, if I could, oh, go, go ahead, Dina. No, no, Jeffrey, go. Oh, if I was just going to jump on to thinking about like like you know, as Dina said, I was sort of absorbing the question of like where's casting's role in racial justice, and 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 thank you both. Uh, you know, Don, for, for what you said. I also, you know, it, it goes also back to what Lavina was saying with, um, with identity conscious casting and what those choices mean, right? If we believe that theater making and storytelling is, the, the, is, is our, our strongest tool to building empathy, to building understanding, to building, you know, um, more holistic and rounded thinking of who we are as human beings, then that's that's where casting is so important in terms of racial justice. That's how we, that's you know telling you know on on TV, film, theater, novels, having it so. My experience, my personal experience, growing up as a kid, the one the one Asian story I read in an English class was the Joy Luck Club, and I barely related to it because I'm like one percent Chinese, and and so of course it's going to be very easy for everybody else to look at an Asian American person and feel like they're other because they, they weren't like, where else are they going to have any other experience to know what they are? And that's where our roles as storytellers can be tools for racial justice, where we can be like, look at this young black man being something other than what you have been told he was supposed to be, or this yeah. young 
Latino, Latina woman. Like, what, look, look at what these people are. L look at how, you know, casting someone with a disability, how we can be like, hey, you know what? You are not, we, we don't see you as, we don't see accommodating you as an, uh, an inconvenience. Your story is a real story and you are a human being and we are so thrilled to have you here. Like, that's where I think casting side by side with the stories that we're choosing to tell um, becomes a tool for that sort of justice as well. Well, thank you both so much um, for this. And Don, you as well. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, we're we're over our time, we but um, <laughs> I feel like we could just keep going and going. Oh, yeah. This is fantastic. <laughs> for sure. Yes. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you both so, so, so much. Um, and for viewers, we are going to tag the full interview with Lavina onto the back of this episode. It's about 20 minutes. Uh, you can watch it now, or you know what? It'll be there tomorrow, the next day, if <laughs> if we've already um, taken up too much of your evening. But we do hope that you check out that full interview. She has some other great um, things to add to this conversation. Um, Josh, are we yes. going to the... Uh, oh, you know what? Let me... Yeah, let me ask Dina, actually, because Dina, you suggested this group. We, we, we like to um, advocate for another organization at the end of every episode. And Dina, you suggested um, the butterfly effect. Can you tell us a little bit about this group and why you, why you chose it? Yeah, so the butterfly effect, um, let me see, I think I actually have this site. It's the butterfly effect migration.org. And this was put together um, by this young girl, she's uh, 12 now, Zoe Ellis. Um, she's with the group, the Alphabet Rockers. If oh, you're yeah. familiar with them. Yeah, and so um, she and another member of the Alphabet Rockers wanted to um, take a stand for uh, migration and, and um, the kids that are down, um, lapped up on the border. And that was a cause that they really felt strongly about. Um, and so they started making like paper cranes, but butterflies on strings. And they started like this letter writing campaign. People started sending butterflies to them. Um, they had thousands of them. Prisoners were sending them. Like all these people were sending <laughs> these beautiful butterflies. They went to DC, they hung in the rotunda um, they've met with um, all the major uh, Congress people and, with, and they raise money um, to help the children on the border. And it's a really beautiful, um, beautiful program. Migration is beautiful. And, um, and, it's, and they, they go on and on and on. You have to check them out. They're pretty cool. And um, yeah, check them out. Great. Thank you so much. That is butterflyeffectmigration.org. Thank you so much for that, Dina. Um, uh, Jeffrey and Dina, thank you both so much. Um, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, remember, you can go to auroratheater.org uh, to find out about the bluest eye, about our membership program, and to make donations. Yes. Um, and again, you can always email us at connects at auroratheater.org. That's connects at auroratheater.org to let us know what you think of the show, what topics you want us to cover, what guests you want to have on. Um, our next episode is on Thursday, April 1st at 5 p.m., where we discuss Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye in preparation for our upcoming opening of our audio drama, The Bluest Eye. Friends, it is Amanda Mason's birthday, and we have gone way over time. So uh, we are going to thank all of our guests um, again. Thank you so much. And for folks who are following along, commenting in the chat, thank you so much. We love having your feedback with us. We saw your shout outs. We did get it. Um, love to you all. Until next time, thanks for staying connected. There we go. Cool. Okay, we are recording. Hi, Lavina. Hey, Don. How's it going? It's going all right. Uh, we did get a little bit of snow yesterday, which I was not happy about, but uh, it's going all right. How about Ugh. you? Chicago is cold. Chicago is cold. It's been raining here. Um, 
but but it's starting to look like spring and it's daylight savings now and that changes my whole world i i know some people are unhappy with the loss of that hour but the extension of daylight brings me profound joy that is true i was one of the people who was unhappy about the loss but that is also true so thank you for the reminder <laughs> Great. Uh, so we're here today to talk a little bit about casting. And I know because you're a dear friend, I know that you work primarily as a director. Um, and of course, as a director, we do tons of casting. But I know you've been brought in also um, as a consultant and for the specific purposes of sort of working as a casting director. So yeah. would you just tell me a little bit about how you found yourself um, in the casting director seat. Yeah, um, it's funny. I um, I mean, I stumbled into an artistic director position in my early 20s. Um, and it was very funny because I came out of undergrad and was like, I'm not going to be an artistic director before I was 30. And it turned out I turned 30 and quit being an artistic director. It's how that one, it's how that one worked out. And, um, and it, it is a South Asian theater company, Ruska Theater Company, which is the Midwest first South Asian ensemble. And so I, I was a de facto... Um, casting director because it was such a small company that casting was part of my job as artistic director. Um, but also as a result of that, and, and um, because I'm also an associate artist at Silk Road Rising, which is one of the places where I've also done some casting consulting, um, I, I, I started to, um, you know, develop a little bit of a local niche with the South Asian community um, was part of it. But also part of it was that, um, you know, it's funny, I was, I was, uh, my, my dad, uh, my parents are not theater makers, so my dad loves saying, for example, I have a master's in arts management, he loves saying like, oh, she has an MBA in her field, like, great. Um, and so um, as a casting director, uh, I realized, I was like, oh, I work in HR. Um, and actually, I I love that. And I think that that's, um, you know, really important in our field. And um, so I spent three years as um, the casting director of Lifeline Theater, um, which is a non-equity company in Chicago that does all original um, ensemble-based adaptation. And, um, you know, so often, much beloved theater company, and um, so often um, people's first experience with the theater was coming into audition. And, um, you know, that or seeing a play. And and so for me, I, I I do as a even as a director like to think as um as casting as like you know the beginning of an ongoing conversation i hope if we like each other um so for me i i really enjoyed and I, I have as you mentioned consulted some other places but um like when i was on staff at lifeline i really enjoyed um being the host of an equitable party or hopefully a more equitable party um you know and that that for me like really ran alongside parallel my work as a director and my my interest in community building um it just turned out you know i i i do like i do prefer directing plays <laughs> so you know as as both parts of my career started to take off i was like okay i'm going to prioritize here the other actually the other part of it um well i will say this the other part of it is um you know and uh, i was i was part time staff and uh Part of it is as a casting director, you know, I like to use the term identity conscious work, which for me means, because I'm a text-based director as well, right? Like here's the givens of the text and here's the givens of the human being and like, let's line them up and and see what that, I had a, I had a professor in undergrad who said like any any theater company with, oh good, I'm wearing my OSF swag for this. Uh, any theater with um, Shakespeare in the title, he was like, any theater company with Shakespeare in the title is effectively a cover band. Um, and I think he kind of meant it as a drag to be honest, but I was like, I am into this. And so like, especially, you know, when I'm working on Shakespeare, when people are auditioning for Shakespeare, I'm like, I want to see a good cover band. Like, I'm not interested in seeing those plays as they were done because I wouldn't have had a seat at that theater. But like, I am interested in a good cover band. And like, can you teach me something about this play that I didn't know was there? Awesome, I definitely wanna be in a room with you. Um, so I was really interested and I continue to be interested in those conversations in general, right? Because I feel like, especially when it comes to like adaptation or the canon, whatever we wanna call it, oftentimes the text is sort of like held up on a pedestal. And I don't know about you, but like for me, uh, you know, as I, was, as I was getting trained and as I was like coming up and assisting, I was in a lot of places where it was like, well, here's the text and the text is on a pedestal and we have to like run and jump and do everything we can to like meet it because the text is good and the text is absolute. Uh, and especially when it comes to Shakespeare where we don't have definitive versions of that text, I'm like, what? Uh, what is the thing that we're chasing? So this idea of being a cover band, if you want to call it that, this idea of identity conscious work and like seeing how these how these givens line up with the givens of the human is very interesting to me. And part of the reason, I'll be honest, that I got out of um, casting was I, I found that we would have a lot of those conversations in um, in the casting process. 
And sometimes those conversations would carry into the rehearsal room, into that process, but sometimes they would not. And and the truth of the matter is I, I could tell even without being in the room for rehearsals. I And it was very surprising to um, a director I worked with when I said, they were like, you can tell, like you can tell if um, uh, a family racially does not biologically look like uh, they are related to each other. And we had that conversation in the casting room, but we didn't have that conversation in the rehearsal room. She's like, you can tell the difference. I was like, yeah, I mean, I think we can tell when people are, are, are living their full truths on stage and when they're not. And I, you know, I, 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 prefer, I prefer to see the full truth. Anyway, that's, that's I think, the TLDR of that. Yes. Um, you said so many wonderful little threads, and I'm going to just try and pick up on all of those threads in the time that we have together. But first, I just want to go back to this term identity conscious, yeah. um, because um, you sort of wrote what is now a notorious how round <laughs> It's article. just because I got pissed off in grad school. Anything I've done that was of any worth was because I got pissed off at somebody while I was in grad school. <laughs> I love it. I love that so much. Um, and, uh, of course, I, you know, read the how round. But oddly enough, I was watching a YouTube on some other completely thing. You know, it's like on Malcolm and Marie or Bridgerton. And she, you know, cuts away to you. And, she, and she's crediting you with the term identity conscious. Um, so one, I just want to know, like, is that your term or where are you getting the term from? And two, would you just um, sort of explicate or just unpack that a little bit more what identity conscious casting really even means? Yeah. And actually, so the Notorious article was the um, color conscious article, right? I wrote two articles about color conscious casting and then um, and then how round approached me about about writing about identity conscious work because because the term had changed. And so, um, right. In grad school, I wrote a piece that is on how round about um, color conscious casting. And, and for me, that was really a rejection of the term colorblind. Right. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what this means. Um, and I, I feel like um, I feel like I, I, I almost like I don't want to say I inherited that term, but that, that term was being used as I was coming into spaces. And I was like, I don't know why. And this doesn't like this doesn't jive with me, but it seems like a thing that other people have accepted and understand. Um, so I started using um, I, I heard people using like. I don't know, colorful or whatever, but but I was like, well, shouldn't it instead of colorblind, shouldn't it be color conscious? I don't think I'm the first person to use that term. I think lots of people were were using it, but I was I wrote this thing when I was in grad school because I felt like um, uh, I knew what it meant and I was collaborating with people, with some people who knew what it meant, but we weren't actually all like, you know, and working with the university system. We actually weren't, um, on the same page about what the work was that I was trying to do and how to go about it. And a lot of that also has to do with like the givens of, um, you know, conservatory training programs and all of, all of that structure, which we don't have time to get into. But, um, so I wrote this thing about color conscious casting as like a rebellion against the term colorblind and it gets retweeted every now and then. And that's great. But I came to realize like that term is really quite limiting, um, because identity, uh, it contains multitudes and, and, and parts of my identity are fluid. And, and for me, it really, and, and, and so I especially started to feel like as, um, you know, as, as a cis straight woman of color, um, you know, color conscious does a lot for me, but it actually doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't contain the multitudes of everybody's identities. And I, and I think, right, that thing that we're after, that thing of like, I, I, I want to see the truth of the text and the truth of the human being lined up. I mean, that, that, however, however it's lined up, right? Uh, I'm playing, I'm finally playing Helena in a Midsummer Night's Dream tonight. I'm very excited about it. Um, I love Zoom acting because you don't have to get off book and I don't have to worry about doing with my lower half of my body. I'm great at it. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, 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 um, it's so funny. I was rereading the play and I was like, I am lining up these dots so differently than I did when I was in my first year of grad school writing papers about Helena. And, um, and I'm so excited to do it tonight. Cause it's gonna, it's gonna live in a different place. Um, just because I'm older and have different points of view and experience on love. But also for me, like I, a, a big part of my identity like one part of my identity that leads is that I'm the child of immigrants that often uh, 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 leads in the space. Um, but also for me, another part of my identity that is is leading more so now these days, and, and, and you know this, that I'm, I'm pretty open about the fact that I'm a recent breast cancer survivor. So um, a play I directed like 15 years ago that I'm eager to get back in the ring with is Steel Magnolias, because that play is about, if anybody's programming this play, I'm available, because that play is about a young woman who has a very serious illness and like the community that supports her. And I'm like, holy shit, I've been through that. 
Like I, you know, it's not the same thing, but I think in terms of like my identity and the identity of that text, like some, one, those things are lining up differently than they did the last time I directed that play. But also I, I, I think like when, when I let that give in, right. And, and like that play is not about cancer, but when I let that give in and my, you know, experience be present as I'm directing that play, I, I, I think the conversations are going to be better. And I think the work is going to be more authentic. Um, does that answer? Oh, so yeah. So the, the term identity, uh, the term identity conscious also like, I don't know, I use it. Um, I didn't, I haven't heard anybody else like, I don't know, claim it as theirs, but also like language is language is language, right? Like, I don't really care. Just like, it, that's the term as it made sense to me from the evolution from colorblind to color conscious to identity conscious. Like that's how I landed there. Um, and, and, and the big thing for me is it's funny. I think, I think people associate that term with me. I mean, yeah, if you want to credit me with that, I was fine. But I, I think the reason people tend to associate me with that term is because I introduce it and then I keep talking about it because I think we have to, I think we can't like, I think we've all been in those rooms where, where I don't want to speak for we, I have been in rooms where people like have the conversation on day one and then it's done. And it's like, Oh good. We had the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about race. Or, or 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 gender or sexual identity, whatever it is, we talked about it. Okay, but then did you keep talking about it? Because like, I mean, and, and you and I know this, right? We've directed OSF, and like that that show that that opens is not the same as the show that closes, and 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 that's true for myriad reasons. But part of it is, you know, the people are different. I was um I was assisting on a production of King Charles the Third that uh. No, I don't want to talk about that one. I want to talk about Roe. Let's talk about Roe, right? Roe is a play that, um, uh, sorry, I should contextualize a little, right? Roe by Lisa Loomer, uh, uh, commissioned by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival as part of the American Revolutions uh, series. Okay. Yeah, and many of our audience will probably have seen Roe because it came oh. to Berkeley Rep. That's so right. That's, oh. Berkeley Rep is right next door to, to Aurora Theater. Perfect, because... We opened it in, in Ashland in 2016, and that play was closing right before the 2016 election. And so we had, um, and we always knew, right? We, all, we, we kept saying we were gonna go to DC, we we're gonna open 36 hours before the inauguration, but we all made an assumption that was incorrect about what that, uh, about that inauguration was gonna be. And then in Berkeley, right? Cause then we went to Berkeley right after Arena, and in Arena, um, Norma McCorvey, who is the historic, right? Who was Jane Roe, passed away our closing weekend in Arena. And so then like we went to Berkeley and it felt like, okay, and now, and now the story is reading in this way. And then I directed it a year later um, at Oslo Rep in Sarasota. And the play is about a lot of things, right? But there are a couple of lines about gun control in that play. And we were playing in Florida shortly after Parkland. And it was like, you know, the, the story is going to, is we're going to receive the story in different ways, in different, in different moments, because, um, because identity is fluid. So like, I guess that's, and I think that's the thing that like can be both, um, right? Cause that's both a specific and open term, which I love, right? I'm saying, hey, you, you, Dawn, I want your Hermia. And so I want you to bring 100% of the truths that you feel like line up with Hermia, that line up with the text. I want those to lead in the space. And I, I might be able as a director, to, to like ask about some things or I may be able to like perceive some parts of your identity. And so like, I may ask some questions about that, right? Because I think we have the conversation and we keep having the conversation, but I also hope over the course of keeping having the conversation that, that the artists in the room will feel comfortable bringing forward parts of their identity that I may not be aware of. And that to me is really exciting when that happens. I love that. I love that so much. Um, these were some of the other threads um, and you, you even circle back to some of them. I loved that you said you wouldn't have had a seat at that theater in terms of talking about, you know, Shakespeare's theater. Um, and also um, you said, you know, that casting is sort of an invitation to be in the community and to have a conversation with the community. So I love thinking about, and even how you just said, we keep having the conversation, uh, how you're bringing, how you're having a community conversation by offering people a seat at your theater, that casting is a way of inviting people in. Um, and so I just wonder in terms of caretaking, what do you think um, some best practices might be around theaters who might be inviting actors with disabilities, might be casting their first, you know, all X 
play, you know, like, you know, this theater might be for the first time in history doing a all, you know, South Asian play or whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, there's an actor who uses a, a mobility device. There's trans actors, whatever that might be. Just what are you learning um, are some best practices around continuing to have that conversation, holding yourself accountable to then inviting people with fluid and different identities into your space? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, there's, there's, there's a couple things, right? Uh, um, but I think the first part of it, right, uh, that you were asking, right, is like, um, and it's, it's honestly part of the reason I, I stopped casting directors, uh, being a casting director is because I'm uh, mouthy. And I um, was uh, sort of notorious with some of the places that I was consulting with because they, they would reach out to me and they would say like, hey, we're trying to reach this community we've never had um, relationships with before. And, and we hear that you are somebody who can maybe help us do that. Um, and, and, and like my thing is though, like, why? <laughs> right? Right. Because like I'm not a silver bullet. And also and again, because I hope if you're bringing me in as a consultant or, or even if I'm just directing one project. Right. Like I hope the conversation, you know, I also used to work in marketing. Right. And so like I don't um, I don't respond well to, you know, when a theater is like kind of the, the one off of like, OK, we're doing a play about this community for the first time. And so we want to do some outreach for them. And I'm like, great. But are you, are you going to continue that conversation? Are they going to be invited to the next like two, three, four, five, whatever place? Um, and so I, I mean, I think in terms of best practices, I actually want to um, I'm going to leave that to the rest of your panel, because I think like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not on staff anywhere. I'm, I'm a bit out of the game. But I think for me, a lot of it, one of the most useful books I read in grad school was uh, not a theater book. It was Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And um, and for me, a lot of it is is why right if you have a strong why i think a lot of the rest of it um kind of ends up sorting itself but i think if a uh, i've had very actually bad collaborations with theater companies who have said to me like we want you to help us reach this community and i say why and if the answer isn't um I don't know, sufficient to me, authentic to me right and that is that is a judgment call i'm making but if there isn't a uh, I would even just say like a confident answer. <laughs> um, uh, 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 it's not going to be a good collaboration for me. And um, uh, and so in those instances, I've walked away. But I also, um, you know, I hope those people still still kept pondering the question of like, why, though? Yeah, that's that's so great. Um, I do want to be mindful and respectful of your time. You have a hard Stop. Give me a couple minutes later. Okay. <laughs> okay, because um, uh, because I do just want to probe just a little bit further in terms of what that is like for you as a director, as a woman director, a woman of color, you know, specifically the child of immigrants, South Asian. Um, what what that feeling is for you to be brought in, um, knowing that it is to target specific groups or how do you like, um, sometimes it feels lousy for me <laughs> to be sort of used in that way. And I, um, you know, part of the episode is about also identifying pitfalls. So I wonder if, if there's any more that you could say. Um, well, uh, yeah, I'll say this, um, right? Uh, uh, my dad described what I was in casting as HR, but also part of it is, and being the child of immigrants, um, uh, so my dad um, is a is a small business owner, and that was actually part of their thing. Um, my parents, obnoxiously cute story. We don't have time. They went to the same high school. They met and fell in love in the states. Um, yeah, and um, part of their partnership was always that one of them would have like a pretty stable job, and that the other would have a little more um, would forge a little bit of a more of a new path. But part of it was also like my parents were always interested in providing opportunities for other people. Um, and it was funny because my mom's a physical therapist and at first it was going to be, she was going to like start her own practice and my dad was the engineer and then like it ended up swapping and whatever. Again, they're obnoxiously cute. But uh, so I think for me, like it is a complicated feeling, right? Because, because I don't like feeling like a silver bullet <laughs> and, um, and, but, so, but, but when it is, and I think particularly like when it is about the South Asian community, I had a fantastic collaboration with, um, Jack Ruler up at, up at Mixed Blood working on Aditi Kapil's Orange and part of it was like, I, I know why you're doing this play. You have a strong why for this play. And I absolutely want this community that you're trying to, I, one, I know you have some relationships with them. I'm just helping you like further those relationships in a very specific way. But also like, those are my people and I want them to get work. 
I want them to be in your play. So, uh, you, you know, I think that that's the, that's the ideal situation. Um, and then I, I think when it's less than ideal, you know, I ask some questions and then make a judgment call. But I think, but I think a lot of it for me is that idea of like wanting to provide people opportunities. I get that from my parents. Um, I will ask this sort of as my last question and, um, it's sort of like director to director, <laughs> you know, often we hear the rhetoric of, you know, I, I, I just wanted the best actor to have the role. I just want to put the best people in the room. And so as a director, when you are casting a project and let's say it's a, it's a Shakespeare or it's your still magnolias of your dreams or one of your Chekhov's that you work on. <laughs> yeah. Um, what does that even mean to you to to cast the best people um and what you know just what is your personal sort of approach to to casting yeah it's interesting right i mean part of it is and i still use that word best sometimes but i'm realizing you know it's it uh, i'm trying to i'm trying to veer away from it a little bit just because especially in the classical community right I, i've been asked god's bread it makes me mad the number of times artistic directors have asked me well is it more important that the work is diverse or the work is good. And I'm like, why are we ask, acting like that? For me, that Venn diagram is a circle, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, for me, actually, I, I, I mean, I think casting is storytelling, right? I, I, I think casting directors should be treated like designers because I think they are them, you know? And, and again, like that was part of it for me was like when I was on staff at places and I was part time, I was sort of like caught, caught in between a rock and a hard place, right? Of like, I'm not actually like, on the production team, but I'm not, you know, full-time staff, but I'm not part of the ensemble. You know what I mean? So it's a little like, ah, who am I representing? And, and but I think, um, you know, for me, I think casting is storytelling. And, and so for me, it's, it's actually just about like, what is, what is the story that I'm most interested in telling right now? Like, what's the story that's unlocking the text for me? And, um, yeah. And then, and then, uh, and right. And that's part of the reason I think we have to like have the conversation and keep having the conversation is because for me, especially in terms of casting, right. We know that it's like not all of the pieces fall in place at once. Right. So sometimes it's like some of the pieces fall in place and then all of a sudden you go, Oh, I thought I was looking for this, but actually now that like these four or five things have sh shaken out this way, I actually need, you know, this to be this other thing. I know this is like hard without examples. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm, I think that's ultimately what we're chasing, right? Is what is the, uh, and it might be the best story. Again, that's subjective. I think for me, it's like, what's the, um, well, right, as directors, right? What's the story that's most in line with the big vision we're chasing? Because, you know, in the casting process, we've already started oftentimes with design. Well, I guess it depends on where we are. But, uh, but yeah, for me, it's about what's the story that lines up best with the whole of the big thing I'm chasing. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Great. Um, before I stop the recording, would you just introduce yourself so we have your name in your own voice? Yeah. Can I bring the dog? Of course. Okay. Hi, I'm Lavina Jadlani. Uh, she, her, hers. This is Mittens Pooja Jadlani. Also, she, her, hers. Great. Thank you so much, Lavina. Um, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop recording. Thank you.